Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Jim Ninsel, host of AZ Illustrated Politics, our weekly analysis and commentary on local, state, and national affairs. On tonight's show, we'll talk with Congressman Ron Barber about the prospects of immigration reform in the House of Representatives and find out why he thinks the Forest Service is rushing the approval process for the Rosemont Mine in the Santa Rita Mountains. Then we'll talk with the AZ Illustrated Politics panel about the news of the week, including the Republican National Committee's opposition to the Gang of Eight's immigration reform proposal, a court ruling against the state's effort to block Planned Parenthood from getting Medicaid dollars, and much more. That's all coming up on AZ Illustrated Politics, but first, a look at today's top stories. Indians are the third largest immigrant group in the United States following Mexican and Chinese nationals, according to a new report from the Migration Policy Institute. The profile showed there are nearly 1.9 million people from India now living in the United States. Data from the U.S. Census Bureau found there are more than 23,000 Indians residing in Arizona, accounting for about 3% of the state's foreign-born population. Indians also account for about 5% of the foreign-born population in the entire U.S. Drivers heading in and out of downtown Tucson will have one fewer option for the start of next week. 6th Avenue will be closed from Toole Avenue to 7th Street on Monday and will see intermittent closures on Tuesday. The roads being, in, being repaved in preparation for becoming a two-way street. And that's a look at tonight's headlines. Earlier this summer, the U.S. Senate passed the Gang of Eight's immigration reform proposal, but it has stalled in the Republican-controlled House of Representatives. Joining me in the studio today to talk about immigration reform and other news from Washington is Congressman Ron Barber. Congressman, welcome to AZ Illustrated Politics. Thanks. Nice to be with you. I just uh, This Gang of Eight immigration reform plan, when it passed out of the Senate at the last minute, they added the so-called border surge, which doubled the number of Border Patrol agents and added funding uh, for a lot more fencing along the border. Some people have said this is overkill. Uh, so even Senator McCain said that it's going to look uh, like the most fortified border since the Berlin Wall came down. It, was it overkill, this final bit of security that they threw in there? Well, it's hard to know where that will end up in, when we end up uh, presumably with a compromise bill between the House and the Senate. What I've been working on as a member of the House our, uh, Homeland Security Committee is a different approach to securing the border. We have to do that. The people that I represent, particularly those in rural areas east of Douglas to New Mexico between the ports of entry, they're still very vulnerable to the cartels, particularly the drug smugglers who come across their land and put their lives in danger. So I'm really focused on making sure that whatever we do, we're going to make that, their lives safer and more secure. The bill that I co-sponsored in the House uh, on the Homeland Security Committee is called the Border uh, Security Results Act. And what it does is requires the Department of Homeland Security to actually come up with a strategic plan with measurements that are developed with public input. Two amendments that I had in that bill insisted that, that were incorporated in the final bill, insisted that the people who live and work on the border, the Border Patrol agents themselves, all the stakeholders have a hand in developing the strategy, strategy going forward, what we need to have on the border, where we need to have it, and that we finally have measurements that are credible. This comes uh, out of a GAO report that I requested a year ago, which showed in the end that the Border Patrol has metrics that are inconsistent, not credible, and we need to do better because we still have too many definitions of what border security really means. So that's where I'm uh, focused is on that bill, and hopefully it'll become the border security plank coming out of the House of Representatives. And the and the the. Gang of Eight's plan has definitely stalled within the House yes. of Representatives, and, and last week the Republican National Committee voted in favor of a resolution that was authored by Tucson and Bruce Ash, uh, right. Arizona's National Committeeman, uh, which actually opposed elements of the Gang of Eight's immigration reform policy, particularly the path to citizenship. It said that uh, there should be no path to citizenship in part of any kind of immigration reform package. Uh, you've supported uh, the path to citizenship. What do you think of uh, this Republican resolution? Well, I think 
you know, they're certainly entitled to a resolution, but what's really going to have to happen is that we have a bipartisan solution between both chambers. And for me, it has to include board security. It has to include temporary worker permits for people to come here and do the work we need to have done. It has to include strict enforcement uh, of uh, hiring uh, through an E-Verify program across the country. It has to include the 11 million people who we don't know who they are. They're in the shadows. Who they are, what they're doing, that's not a good uh, situation for our country. We need to bring them out of the shadows. They need to do all of the, take all of the steps that are prescribed, learn English, pay fines, back taxes, go to the back of the line, and then they can embark on what I call a path to legal status. Uh, and then finally, because we have high-tech needs in our country, we need to expand the H-1B visa program so that we can retain these really well-trained young people who come to our universities, get doctorates in science and technology. We need to keep them here. It's a very complicated set of issues, and I'm hopeful that in the end, we will have a bipartisan solution out of both chambers that will address all of those components. But is a path to citizenship a deal breaker for Democrats? Does that have to be in a package? I think it's hard to say. I think you know, there's been a lot of compromises made. The gang of eight, then the gang of seven in the House have been working on this issue for four years, actually, and they have a proposal that has yet to be revealed in the House, quite frankly. We don't know what that contains. You know, that group, I think, is probably going to lay out the best compromise, including whatever the language is that relates to path to citizenship or path to legal status. I, we really have to bring the 11 million people into the light of day and make sure that they, the people who uh, are good people who have not committed crimes stay here to a process that allows them to stay, as I described, and that keeps families together. I think it's in the best interest of the country to do that. When I look at border security, I also think of economic security. There have been a lot of studies that say that if we take action to fix the broken immigration system, it's going to have a great economic benefit to the country, and I believe that's true. And one other aspect that's not often discussed is what the uh, what we need to do at the ports of entry, Nogales and Douglas in, in our part of the world. Those ports are vital to our uh, legal commerce, and unfortunately we've never staffed them properly uh, to expedite legal commercial traffic coming through. If we can add border uh, uh, customs agents to the mix, we will actually increase our economy here in the Southwest. When I was talking to people who own uh, Park Place and, uh, and uh, Tucson Mall, they tell me that 30% of their revenue comes from citizens from Mexico. It could be even more if we fix the port of entry staffing problem. It's very complex. The whole thing, I think, has to be looked at in total. I don't think we can piecemeal it. I think we have to go for a comprehensive plan, hopefully a bipartisan plan across both chambers. As long as we're talking about border issues, uh, the Arizona Republic reported that the Department of Homeland Security spent $15 million to build 21 homes and buy 20 mobile homes in Ajo for border patrol agents. And you asked for an investigation into why the costs are so high. What are you hoping to see from that? Well, I need an explanation of why it is that we uh, spent an average of $600,000 to build homes in Ajo with the average price of homes is $70,000. I want our Border Patrol agents to be properly accommodated because they do tough jobs every single day. But what went on in Ajo does not make sense. At a time when we're cutting back on uh, the work hours for Border Patrol agents and the work hours for Customs agents, we may go to furloughs because of sequestration for both uh, entities. This is no time to be wasting taxpayer money as I see it on homes that are way above the market price in that community. So I've asked for an investigation. I've written to the acting commissioner of CBP, uh, and I've said, you know, tell us why this was done, uh, who authorized it, what the individual cost of homes are, because it doesn't make sense to me in a time of fiscal uh, difficulties that we could be spending that kind of money. And this is not just unique to the AHO situation. As a member of the Homeland Security Subcommittee on Oversight and ranking member, I've been asking the department over and over again for better transparency and accountability. There are far too many things that are done that make no sense and money that's not spent wisely, including SBINet, which uh, was a very large waste of money when it was put into, uh, into the process. So we have to do better. We've given them a lot of money. They have to be better, uh, more accountable for it and do a better job spending it.
Yeah, let me shift gears a bit, ask you about the Rosemont Mine. Earlier this month, you and Congressman Grijalva wrote a letter to the U.S. Forest Service to slow down the process to allow for more public participation. Right. Uh, Rosemont President Ron Pace says that the review of the plan has been going on for more than six years now. It's time for a decision. Uh, what are your concerns about the mine? Well, I want to make sure that the people that I represent, uh, and it's all, certainly all of uh, District 2, but in particular, the people who will be affected by the Rosemont Mine, I want to make sure they have their say, that they have time to have their input considered. The citizens of Green Valley and Serena in particular are concerned about the water underneath their homes and their businesses. The aquifer is already depleted. And I have said over and over again to the officials who uh, are responsible for Rosemont and Augusta, how are you going to replenish the water that you're taking out of the aquifer? Because if you take it out and don't replenish it, the citizens of, C of C uh, Green Valley and Sarita are going to be in pretty bad shape. And future development of businesses and homes down there will not be feasible. That's a central issue for me. There are a lot of issues with Rosemont Mine. But we have to make sure that we have time to do this properly. It wasn't just a few weeks ago that Rosemont decided they were going to change their mining plan of operation. They say it's only a minor change and it was consistent with what the Forest Service wanted. Not by my standards. It looks like a significant change that would lengthen the time that mine's in operation from 20 years to 25 or 30 years, even more of a situation of a problem with water. So I want to make sure that that's properly looked at. 17 cooperating agencies have submitted input to the Forest Service over the last week or two. That needs to be considered. We don't need to rush this. I'm not wanting to postpone it forever, but we have to do it right. I'm actually in favor of mining. In Arizona, we have resources that we need to mine, but we need to do it right when it comes to deciding where and when and how to do it, and that's what I want. I want the citizens of, uh, of this community that I represent to have their say and to be fully considered when the Forest Service makes its decision. We've only got about a minute left, but a lot of talk about the potential of a government shutdown uh, this fall yeah. over the funding of Obamacare. Is that going to happen in Washington? Well, I certainly hope not. I think it's a very bad idea. You know, when we think about shutting government down, we think about hurting a lot of people. Um, how do we administer Social Security checks, uh, Medicaid and Medicare systems? Uh, how do we ensure that kids in Head Start get the, what they need? How do we make sure that our military and other operations are properly functioning? It's just a terrible idea, and we shouldn't be going there. We need to find a compromise between the Republicans and the Democrats. I've been working on bipartisan issues since I got there. We can and, do, and we must do this, a middle ground where we can find a way to go forward and have a budget that we all agree on. Yes, there are going to be cuts, but also there have to be consideration of which cuts make the most sense. We have to move forward, and a government shutdown is the worst idea possible. All right, and unfortunately, that's all we're going to have time yeah. for today, but I appreciate you stopping by the AZ Illustrated Politics to uh, talk about these issues. And we will be right back with our weekly panel. President Obama called the alleged chemical weapons attack in Syria a grave concern and added, as difficult as the problem is, it will require America's attention. The United Nations announced today one million children have now been driven from Syria by their country's bloody civil war. We take a closer look at the swelling number of refugees, particularly the young. Separate juries issued decisions today in two high-profile military cases. Army Major Nadal Hassan was convicted of murder for the deadly shooting spree aimed at unarmed U.S. soldiers at Fort Hood, Texas. And Staff Sergeant Robert Bales was sentenced to life without parole in the massacre of 16 innocent Afghan civilians. We get details of both military court outcomes. And in a separate military case, the Army private found guilty of giving trolls of highly classified information to WikiLeaks now wants to live as a woman, Chelsea Manning. Ray Suarez examines the legal and cultural questions connected with this story. And we look back at Robert McNeil questioning the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. on the fight for civil rights on NBC's Meet the Press just three days before the 1963 March on Washington. That's all ahead on tonight's News Hour. Tonight on Arizona Week, we look at society 50 years after Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. Is equality still a dream or has it become a reality? Tonight at 8.30 on PBS 6. 
Last week, the Republican National Committee passed a resolution opposing the path to citizenship. That was part of the immigration reform plan that was passed by the Senate earlier this summer. Here to talk about immigration reform and other news of the week, Attorney Jeff Rogers, the former chairman of the Pima County Democratic Party, Tucson Tea Party founder Trent Humphreys, and Tucson Hispanic Chamber of Commerce President Leah Marquez-Peterson. Thanks to all of you guys for being here. Thanks. Leah, this whole question of the path to citizenship seems to be one of the things that's really holding up the immigration reform package in the House. And we had the RNC resolution last week. What, what did you think of that? You know, it's interesting. We've been having a number of conversations with Senator John McCain, who visited us at the chamber office, Congressman Gosar, Congressman Salmon. It is a, it is a hot issue. I hope that if the line is drawn in the sand and that is the no-go or, or no go or go decision, that there's some compromise that can be made. Uh, in talking to the Republican leaders in our state, especially those congressmen, it seemed like it was a deciding factor. And Trent, uh, your thoughts. Is a path well, to citizenship again, the I, wrong I, way to go? I, I've never been a fan of the, the, you know, a lot of things in the Senate bill. You know, and uh, and the path to citizenship. You know, look, if you're gonna if you're gonna put the pieces into place, that might be part of. It. I mean, I, I'm saying, but but the way the whole Senate bill is constructed, I think it needs to be torn down, rebuilt with ways that make sense. It seemed like a lot of stuff was thrown in there that just says, you know, a yada 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 z. And I, I think that if there is going to be a path to citizenship, I think that there has to be a, a better framework for that to happen, and I think it has to be worked through in a better method that was done. And it has to include the House and, and, and other players as well. And Jeff's the path to citizenship a deal breaker for Democrats to support this plan? Well, I think it is, and I think it's also uh, a deal breaker with the American public. Uh, polls consistently show that 75 to 85 percent of Americans support a path to citizenship like the one described in the uh, Senate bill. It's an arduous path. It's 13 years, uh, 10 years you, you do, before you can even get a green card, and you have to pass a background check. There's a myriad of things you must meet before you could get a green card, and then three more years after that, so a total of 13 years before you could get citizenship. And you, you must understand that even 60% of Republicans, in, in poll after poll after poll, uh, agree with this arduous path to citizenship. So, so I think what we see here is we see a very narrow uh, partisan part of the Republican Party, the sort of Tea Party element of the Republican Party, and and they are basically you know pandering to their base. Right now, everyone believes that there are plenty of votes to pass the Senate bill in the House if they can get it to the floor. Now it will take you know most all of the Democrats. And you know, 30, 40 Republicans, and they, and they're you know people are saying those votes are there. We hear from uh, uh, Congressman Gutierrez that he has he's he's already got the names and the list of people who will vote for it. So it's a matter of are they going to continue to pander to the base and and once again lose another segment of the population? You know, they alienated LGBT voters, they've alienated Hispanic voters, they've alienated women. And so, I mean, you know, the Republican Party really needs to get on board with what the American people believe needs to be done with this issue. And Leah, you've spoken with John McCain about this. He's really meeting with business uh, groups around the state trying to sell this plan. He is. He's meeting with a number of different chambers around the state, and with particular emphasis on guest worker programs and kind of the, the complexity of the Senate bill. We asked him specifically for advice as we met with Republican congressmen uh, in the Phoenix area in terms of what, what direction should we take? What can we do to, to encourage immigration reform? And we talked through some of those different pivotal pieces. Certainly our chamber is supportive of, of a pathway to citizenship, but ultimately I think majority of our chamber members believe we need, we need something to happen. The time is now, the momentum is now, immigration reform makes sense now. Will it happen before December? Will it happen through the House in one complete package or individual bills as they maneuver and negotiate within their committees? I mean, politics, <laughs> it's very complex. <laughs> and Trent, Senator McCain has made the argument that uh, in, in order to compete for Latino voters, there has to be some kind of immigration reform plan. What do you think of well, look, Senator uh, McCain's argument there? I, I'm, I'm just not impressed with the political argument. I mean, we have to look at how is this bill good for the middle class of America? You know, and say we we've seen the CBO report. CBO reports. There's a lot of things not to like for the middle class of America in this bill, and I think that you know we say, well, we have to do this to buy voters. That, that's that's just politics. We want what's good for Americans, what's good for us going forward. And you know, if we're saying we're going to have a, a bill out there that's going to end illegal immigration forever, let's make sure that it does. And and according to the CBO, this bill does not. You know, yeah. and so that's that's part of it. Is if you're going to, and so there, there are pieces of this bill that can help. You know, guest worker programs could be approved right away, especially for high-skilled workers to come over here and get to work, for healthcare workers. That needs to happen. You know, but I think the problem is you try to look, look, 
attach all this other garbage in there, and some of it has nothing to do with immigration that's in this bill. You know, and that's the part, part of the problem, and, you know, 1,200 pages and, with kickbacks and, and buy-offs. And we, I think we need to look at it and say, okay, what, what, do we, what can we do right now that 90% that of the people agree on? There's get a myriad of passed. economic studies out there showing that this will not only lower the deficit, but that it will be an economic boon to America to pass immigration reform. And, and they disagree with the CBO. Yeah, and, and there are many studies out there that, that, <laughs> are, that are now saying that. And I, and I believe they're probably correct. Um, you know, this is going to be something that's going to be good for America. It's going to be good for America's middle class. And, uh, and, and I can't see doing something like Bruce Ash has proposed in the Republican National Committee, uh, approved of a week or so ago, which is basically create a, an apartheid type system where you have this sub-citizen group that can never gain citizenship and has to apply every two years for another work permit. And they don't even, their, their bill doesn't even allow, or their new proposal doesn't even allow for the dreamers who came here through no fault of their own to have a, a path to citizenship. So this, this is a non-starter. Lee, what do you think of the McCain argument about the importance of, of putting the Republican Party on a level playing field to try to attract Latino voters by passing this? I mean, this was topic of conversation, certainly, during the, the last election. And I think, ultimately, we want to see economic recovery. We want to see jobs. I mean, that's, that's a priority for the Latino community. Is immigration a, a, something that will, you know, certainly affect their position on the Republican Party? I think it will have impact on that. We want to see, I think, as a Latino community, as Americans in general, immigration reform happen. The, the, I think the stars are aligning. I think the time is now. The messiness of creating comprehensive immigration reform in the House, um, it, you know, it was very concerning to meet with Congressman Salmon and Gosar and to hear of their different perspectives in terms of how this could work through various committees and the, the, the players, uh, the involvement of, of different issues at the federal level and how that could impact. I mean, the messiness, I guess, of creating a bill such as this and something that's so comprehensive, it's daunting. And Jeff, I want to shift topics here to the Rosemont Mine. Uh, the Forest Service is getting ready to have some kind of final approval of whether or not the uh, mine can use the federal land as its storage for its tailings and whatnot. Uh, they, the mine itself owns the area it wants to mine, but it does not own the area where they want to store the tailings. And uh, Congressman Grijalva and Congressman Barber both wrote a letter to the Forest Service saying they thought the, or the Agricultural Secretary actually, to say, slow down this process. And it seems like there's a deadline in, towards the end of September where the process changes and this Forest Service wants to get it done before that. Well, and Rosemont Mine wants to get it done before that. The process now has a, has a very short period of time and for, for public comment. And so what they would like to do is push it a little further along so that there's an enlarged period of time for public comment. And, and I, I, I agree with that. You know, look, this is, uh, this is not, uh, not a mine that's going to be here for many generations, like San Manuel and many of the other mines who, where you could say, I'm working at the mine and my grandfather worked at the mine. This is a one-generation mine, 20 years probably, 25 maybe maximum. And, uh, and, and so a short-term thing like that, are we going to allow it to perhaps destroy the aquifer for the city of Tucson, to, uh, to pollute the aquifer? And there are many people, many scientists, who are, who are, who are troubled by the fact that, that perhaps they haven't presented a proposal that will really guarantee that they can keep the aquifer clean and that they can also recharge the aquifer because they're going to be using a huge amount of water uh, in the mining process itself. So I, I think, you know, that there's no hurry here. A few extra weeks uh, uh, for some additional Additional public comments is a good thing, and I know that the mine would like to—they'd like to rush it through because they think they're on the cusp of getting it through. But there's also a new lawsuit against them, uh, against the uh, uh, the Arizona Department of Environmental Quality, uh, challenging the fact that they issued an air quality or water quality permit and said that they didn't follow the right procedures. And so, you know, this thing's going to be up in the air for a while. I get the feeling. Leah, the Hispanic Chamber does support the uh, mine. Uh, Rod Pace says this is the CEO of Rosemont, says this has been going on for 60 years now. It's time for a decision. Absolutely. So we, I, I disagree. I think that it's been six years of public comment. This has been in the forefront of a lot of our media and our debate within our community. It's 1,200 construction jobs, 450 direct jobs, the economic impact. We need this in our community. To delay the process further, I think, is, is politics. Trent, your thoughts Eventually on the rule of law has to prevail. I mean, you can you can file lawsuits and lawsuits and lawsuits, but you know they've met everything that was put in front of them, and uh, you know and it was tough. It's not like you know they just walked into town and signed you a few papers and it was good. You know they've done a tremendous amount, and, and they've worked hard for this community. They've shown that they're not fly by night. They've done a lot of things. They've supported a lot of good things in this community, and uh, you know and, and eventually 
you just have to let the law win out. You can't, you know, the, the law is not a game that you can keep, you know, finding different ways to. You have to, you have to do what what's there. Now, some people may not agree with it, but eventually, you have to, you have to pass the mind and get those jobs here because we desperately need them. And Leah. Uh Arizona Treasurer Doug Ducey this week announced a uh, policy group that's going to be advising him through his exploratory campaign for governor. Uh, John Kyle is heading that up, but you're also on that. What, what do you like about uh, Doug Ducey for governor next year? You know, I was honored to work with Doug Ducey on the Prop 204 campaign. Our chamber sided with him against uh, that proposition and got involved with him quite a bit at the grassroots level and just really respected his outreach in the community. I think his his uh, business experience and the way he's handled this, the Department of, of Treasury has been wonderful. Um, I was honored to be considered for his, uh, his policy group and look forward to working with Senator Kyle and the others that are in the group. And Trent, you've told me you think he's the front runner in this. Uh, it's a crowded field. You've it it this, is. It's, uh, you, I it, think at least a half dozen candidates. It's easily. I mean, like I say, that, that's a smart move for him to pick up Leah like that. I mean, that was something that I told you. You know, he's he knows who the players are. He knows the people that, that can give him good input. He, he's been around, and uh, and like I said, we we just had the report too that the state just reported this, uh, a surplus of what 380 million dollars. Congratulations. That's you know the Treasury did a good job there. Um, so yeah, I, I, th I think he's a strong candidate, and I think that you know that if he continues, that doesn't mean he can he can just take some time off and go you know, go on vacation. But I, I think that if he continues to work as hard as he has, I think that that pathway is open to him to be getting our next governor. And Jeff, it is going to be a crowded field on the Republican side. You've got Secretary of State Ken Bennett, you've got uh, Mesa Mayor Scott Smith, the former Tempe Mayor Hugh Holloman, uh, State Senator Al Melvin, former Maricopa County Attorney uh, Andrew Thomas, and one woman, uh, Christine Jones, the former counsel for GoDaddy. Does, uh, you're, you're, how do you, uh, well, I, you, know, you think Ducey is the front runner? I here? used to be the kind of Democrat who rooted for the worst possible Republican, so we had a better chance of beating him. Well, as I mature, I root for who I think the best possible Republican is. Is, and I don't think it's Doug Ducey. Doug Ducey opposed the, the, the sales tax that we needed when education was in a crisis and our budget was in a crisis. He opposed the continuation of that. Um, he also opposed the Medicaid expansion. Um, he's brought on board Kathy Herod of the Center for Arizona Policy. I'm kind of shocked to see Leah join this crowd. This is a crowd of people, including John McCain, that represent really the, the, the sort of unbelievable Tea Party birther wing of the Republican Party. And I'm, this man has, is showing us that that's the direction he's going in. And, and I'm not, this is not, not very exciting for me. I mean, even John McCain, John McCain um, uh, blocked uh, Bill Clinton's only Latina that he tried to appoint to the bench in the 1990s. John McCain, for the year and a half, sat on Rosemary Marquez's nomination and blocked it. We have no Latino currently on the active court, and uh, and and you can thank John, Mc or I, I mean John Kyle for that, not John McCain. Yeah, like, and so I think that's so. Even I, why and I'm real troubled by that, and and you know, and now we, 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 we just we just heard that, that finally Rosemary's going to get a hearing, but that's because Kyle's gone. And we have completely supported Rosemary Marquez for that position. I think she would be excellent. But I think that's even why it's so much more important that I'm participating on this. You're right. I could have looked at the politics involved and thought, hmm, is this quite a fit? But from a Southern Arizona perspective, a Latino perspective, this is a great opportunity. Okay. And we're just going to have to leave things there. And I'm very sorry because I know you wanted to remember Dave Sitton, uh, but we are unfortunately out of time. Uh, thank you all for joining us this evening. And we will be right back with some closing thoughts. You can learn more about politics by visiting azpm.org or by following us on Facebook and Twitter. Stay tuned next for the news hour, and then at 8.30, Arizona Week takes a look at race relations in Arizona. On Monday, AZ Illustrated Metro takes a look at Tucson's student housing market. And join us here next Friday for an interview with Congressman Raul Grajava and another look back at the Week in Review. I'm Jim Ninsel. Thanks for watching, and have a great weekend.